Keeping Peace with Others by William S. Plumer The word peace is applied to our habits, pursuits, and dispositions towards others. Follow peace with all men, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Each of the other kinds of peace is a rich blessing. This is a weighty duty. On this point, the scriptures are very clear and full. Paul says, Let us follow after the things which make for peace. Romans chapter 14, verse 19. God hath called us to peace. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Live in peace. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. He also commands us to pray for our rulers, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. The Apostle James also says, The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. James chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Our blessed Savior also said to his disciples, Have peace one with another. Mark chapter 9, verse 50. So that there is not left the shadow of a doubt respecting the binding obligation upon all men to have and to manifest peaceable dispositions at all times. Nor should we ever forget that the duty is enjoined with great frequency and solemnity. We should therefore address this with much seriousness and earnestness. Nor are we at liberty to limit our endeavors after peace to friendly relations. We must follow peace with all men. We are not at liberty to confine our efforts in this behalf to a few and those of our own circle or party. We must let our endeavors extend to all with whom we have dealings. If a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, ye shall not vex him. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 33. What then is enjoined on us in maintaining peace with our fellow men? The answer is that, first, we are bound to entertain peaceable and friendly thoughts respecting all men. In the heart is the seat of every virtue. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. If men be not in their temper and disposition peaceful, it is certain that they do in their hearts violate the whole spirit of the gospel. Nor will it be possible for such to make their outward conduct conform to the scriptural standard. Another thing to be done in fulfillment of our duty is to speak peaceably. The peace of neighborhoods is often destroyed by words. Grievous words stir up anger, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. Where no wood is, the fire goeth out. So, where there is no talebearer, the strife ceaseth, Proverbs chapter 26, verse 20. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 8. Render not railing for railing, see 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Paul warns us against strifes of words, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, and 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. Rash words may have as ill an effect as those which are the fruit of a truly malignant design in destroying the peace of families and of neighborhoods. A whisperer separateth chief friends, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 28, and an angry man stirreth up strife. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 22. We cannot, therefore, be too guarded in our speech. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. And every prudent man will pray, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Psalm chapter 141, verse 3. A good man has said, Before we allow ourselves to find fault with any person behind his back, we should ask ourselves three questions. One, is it true? Two, is it kind? Three, is it necessary? A little heart searching, even a little reflection before a hard speech would effectually prevent much misery.
Another matter required of us is to act peaceably. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 24. And here the scripture furnish us both with rules and with examples. Take the case of Abram and Lot, the uncle and the nephew. These two great men had each many flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Genesis chapter 13, verse 6 through 9. Strife can hardly subsist where such a temper is manifested. There is no fuel to keep the fire burning. One of the most serious hindrances to the peace of many men and many communities is found in occasional outbursts of bad temper. Some men are constitutionally moody. They are not, and without miracle they could not be uniform. Their feelings vary with the wind, with the state of their stomachs, and with other mutable things. Others are nervous and are easily provoked to tears or to passion. Some are naturally choleric and excitable. Many from early infancy have had bad precepts and worse examples held up before them. Some are fretted and crossed in childhood and youth until they are like the trained whelps of the tiger. All this is to be greatly deplored, for a wrathful man stirreth up strife. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 18. Indeed, the first bursts of passion are often like coals thrown among shavings. There is no telling what will be the end of the mischief done. It would vastly conduce to peace if men could be induced to guard against all causes, occasions, and beginnings of discord. The beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water, therefore leave off contention before it be meddled with. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 14. Nip the evil in the bud is one of the best rules. Nor do we follow peace when we allow ourselves to be made parties to contests which do not concern us. He that passeth by and meddleth with strife belonging not to him is like one that taketh a dog by the ear. Proverbs chapter 26 verse 17. One of the greatest disturbers of peace is pride. It is sure to be insolent. It struts and boasts and vapors and provokes others. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 25. Only by pride cometh contention. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 10. There is a wrath of pride. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 24. Ambition also begets many contests. There never was a more unhappy state of feeling in the family of our Savior than when there was also a strife among them, which of them should be greatest. Luke chapter 22 verse 24. It would greatly conduce to the advancement of peace if men could be induced to put a just estimate on its value. In the eyes of a wise and good man, it is always of great price. In Scripture, it is mentioned side by side with the most excellent things. By one prophet, God says, Love the truth and peace. Zechariah chapter 8 verse 19. By one apostle, he says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. So that if truth and holiness are of great price in the eyes of God and good men, so is peace. In his old age, John Newton wrote, Peace and holiness are the peculiar characteristics of a disciple of Jesus.
They are the richest part of the enjoyments of heaven, and they are more inseparably connected between themselves than some of us are aware of. The longer I live, the more I see of the vanity and sinfulness of our unchristian disputes. They eat up the very vitals of religion. Our great guarantee against a disturbed, distracted existence is to be found in God alone. He is our refuge as well as our strength. Thus says David, Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Psalm chapter 31 verse 20. Nor can we easily overestimate the evils that flow from a state of carnal strife between man and man or between the sections of a community. Where envying and strife is, there is a confusion and every evil work. James chapter 3 verse 16. See also Galatians chapter 5 verse 15. Yet so inveterate is this spirit of contention, and so dreadfully does it blind the mind, that it is with great difficulty men of strife can be brought to believe that they are injuring and degrading themselves by all their malice. It is an honor for a man to cease from strife, but every fool will be meddling. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 3. Such a sentence is either not heeded by them, or it strikes terror into their consciences. Other portions of God's word are no less explicit. Paul puts wrath and strife in a list of vices of the most hateful character. Galatians chapter 5 verse 19 through 20. James says, If ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. James chapter 3 verse 14. Nothing should more arouse us to this duty than the example of our blessed Lord. Of him it was foretold that he shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. Matthew chapter 12 verse 19. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 23. We can now see why our blessed Savior spoke as he did concerning those who, with a good will, seek to promote peace around them. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Matthew chapter 5 verse 9. And can any imagine a more interesting sight than a community regulated by such principles as the gospel enjoins on this subject, where would be nothing to hurt or destroy in all of God's holy mountain? But the question arises, how far are we to bear and forbear? How much must we yield for peace? Is it possible for us to control other people's minds and acts in this manner? And here it is pleasant to be able to say that the Bible prescribes no impossible tasks. Its language is, if it be possible, as much lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Romans chapter 12 verse 18. How plain and how safe is this rule? Up to the measure of our ability we must go, but the law extends no further. Nay, the scriptures tell us of one great and good man whose lament was, My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Psalm chapter 120, verse 6 through 7. They go further and tell us of some who preach Christ even of envy and strife. Philippians chapter 1 verse 15 through 16. There is no limit to the contentious propensities of some. They introduce virulence even into their most solemn public acts in religion. Some do all this and yet add all the time great professions of love. Thus, in the days of Micah, God speaks of prophets that make my people err, that bite with their teeth and cry, Peace! And he that putteth not into their mouths, they even prepare war against him. Micah chapter 3 verse 5. We are then not at liberty to forsake God or deny his truth in order to promote peace. On the contrary, we must obey God rather than men. We must contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints. We must never make shipwreck of faith. We must never part with a good conscience. Buy the truth and sell it not. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 23.
Sell it not, even for peace. The world asks too dear a price for its smiles or its favor when it asks us to renounce the faith of God's people or purity of mind. Nor is it necessarily proof of a wrong spirit in us to refuse to surrender our just and legal rights merely because others choose to attempt to take them from us. Paul exclaimed, I am a Roman citizen. I appeal unto Caesar. Acts 25 verse 11. Nor can any sober man deny that his retention of his rights in these cases was every way justifiable. This will suggest our right course respecting lawsuits. We should not engage in these from ambition or a love of contention. We should not be litigious. Oftentimes a bad settlement is better than a good lawsuit. Those who love to resort to courts seldom thrive. As the wolf spends all his strength in escaping from the dogs and the hunters, although he eats many sheep, so the enormous expenses of the practiced litigant, even when successful, very much exhaust his means and keep him poor. This concludes the reading of Keeping Peace with Others by William S. Plumer. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button so that videos like these can spread to more people. Thank you so much for following along, and we'll catch you in the next video.